Okay, <clears throat> today the topic uh, is a double one, dealing with perception and the primary secondary quality distinction. These are very closely related topics, uh, as we'll see. And the various luminaries here, uh, all of whom have something to do with Oxford. Uh, <clears throat> there's Robert Boyle, who did his famous uh, experiments, more or less founding the science of chemistry in Oxford. John Locke of Christchurch. Bishop Berkeley, who died and is buried in Oxford. He was visiting his son at Christchurch at the time. Uh, A.J. Ayer, who was a uh, Wickham Professor of Logic at New College. J.L. Austin, and Peter Strawson, whom we've already met. Now, as explained in the introductory lectures, a lot of these problems arose precisely because of the development of modern science in the early modern period. In particular, the move away from Aristotelianism to a mechanical account of the world implied explaining perception not in terms of uh, some kind of thing coming from the object to the eye which was somehow intrinsically similar to the object so that we directly grasp its qualities, but rather in terms of causal intermediaries, particles or waves, uh, little particles of light that bounce off the objects and come to our eyes and are then interpreted by our brains uh, <clears throat> in order to give us perception of objects. Now obviously the, the issue doesn't only uh, affect organs of sight, but all of our senses, but most of the discussions of this period tend to be focused on sight or to some extent touch. Those are the senses that seem to come closest to giving us uh, a presentation of objects as they are altogether. Now, this kind of view of the world started, as we saw, with Galileo and Descartes, but Locke's account is the one that was most influential. So, when people discuss these issues, it's typically against the background of a Lockean account of perception and the primary secondary quality distinction. So, what are objects like? When we perceive objects, when we see them in particular, there are impressions caused in us in our brains somehow by means of our sense organs, particularly our eyes. But we hypothesize that these are caused by particles or waves of light coming from the objects. And the properties of those particles or waves bear no resemblance at all to the objects themselves. They somehow convey that information, uh, but we're aware that there is very complex processing go that goes on with the particles or waves hitting the retina, uh, <coughs> messages traveling down the optic nerve, somehow being synthesized by the brain and so on. First of all, it does imply that that intermediary process involves things that are quite unlike either the perceptions that we have mentally and also probably quite unlike the objects themselves. If we're thinking in terms of a mechanical paradigm that the best explanation of how things happen is basically things bashing into each other, then that naturally suggests that the explanation of all this process had better be in mechanical terms. We'll naturally see geometrical and dynamical properties, things like shape and size and motion, as being the crucial causal determinants of what happens. Now John Locke, as we've seen before, um, took over Boyle's corpuscularian hypothesis. Um, he mentions it actually explicitly in, in the essay only once, uh, the book four, um, <coughs> part three, sec section 16, he doesn't commit himself to this. He doesn't say this is definitely the right account of things, but he says this seems to come closest to an intelligible explanation of how things work. So the corpuscularian hypothesis 
hypothesis explains the properties of different substances, say gold or lead or whatever it may be, as arising from their particular microstructure. So the hypothesis is that the microstructure of gold is different from the microstructure of lead in a way that explains their different properties. Why they have the colour they do, why they melt at the temperature that they melt at, why they're as hard as they are, and so on. So the microstructure is supposed to consist of lots of little corpuscles. Now these corpuscles are likely to vary between the different substances. Presumably they do vary. They might vary in shape, in size, and in organisation. They might be differently packed, say. But the corpuscularian hypothesis involves the conjecture that all of these corpuscles are made of the same stuff. So they may vary in their properties, shape and size and so on, but they're made of the same stuff, which Boyle called universal matter. And when Locke talks about pure substance in general, it seems likely that he is referring to the same kind of thing. Except, of course, when Locke talks about pure substance in general and the ideas we have of it, he doesn't want to commit himself to the corpuscularian hypothesis. So he's talking about the stuff of which things are made, whatever that is. On the corpuscularian hypothesis, it would be the universal matter from which the corpuscles are composed. So this underlying substance is hypothesized to have primary qualities, that is shape, size, movement, texture, and what Boyle called impenetrability, and what Locke called solidity. And these are the qualities which are supposed to belong, as it were, intrinsically to uh, the stuff. And those are the qualities in terms of which the appearance of the stuff to us is to be explained. So the secondary qualities, things like color, smell, taste, the qualities that appear to us are explained by the primary qualities, they are in themselves nothing like what we see. So when I see something, suppose I look at the light and I see it as yellow, there is nothing in the light remotely like my idea of yellowness. It's rather that the primary qualities somehow cause that idea in me. So being yellow is a matter of having the power to produce the idea of yellow, that phenomenal idea that we are familiar with from seeing yellow, it's having the power to produce that in an observer who's suitably placed. So let's focus on the problem here by considering uh, the case of a circular hot plate. Suppose there's an electric hot plate on an oven and it's been heated up until it's glowing red hot. Okay, quite familiar. I bring my hand close to the hot plate and I feel warmth. I bring it still closer and I feel pain. Well, the sensations of felt warmth and pain are clearly in the mind. We don't attribute the pain to the hot plate itself. We're not even tempted to do that. Warmth may be less clear, but at least the felt sensation of warmth, we won't attribute that to it. The circular shape, well, we are inclined to attribute that to the object. Uh, the hot plate really is circular, we think. What about the red colour? The red circle that we see when we look at the hot plate. Is that in the mind or is it in the object? And you can see that there's a bit of a tension here. When we look at objects and see them as coloured, we're naturally to th inclined to think of the colour as there in the object. But if we start speculating about the mechanisms of perception, as one naturally does in the early modern period, and now, of course, you're naturally led to think, hang on, it can't be like that. Though we're inclined to attribute the redness to the thing itself, actually, there's no way there can be anything remotely like the redness in the object. Now, there's a well-known text in Locke's essay, uh, Book 2, Chapter 8, uh, Section 10, which is quite notorious. Locke here is drawing a distinction between primary and secondary qualities, and he is discussing what he understands by a secondary quality. So he talks about such qualities, which in truth are nothing in the objects themselves, 
but powers to produce various sensations in us by their primary qualities, i.e. by the bulk, figure, texture and motion of their insensible parts, as colours, sounds, tastes, etc. These I call secondary qualities. OK, so you've got the primary qualities in the object, the bulk, figure, texture, motion. You've got the secondary qualities, colours, sounds, tastes and so forth, which are, he says, nothing in the objects themselves, but powers to produce ideas in us. Now, that comma before but is rather unfortunate. It gives the impression that Locke is saying that secondary qualities are nothing in the objects themselves. That's quite different from saying that they are nothing in the object but powers. They're nothing but powers. They are in the object, but they are powers. Now, some people have interpreted Locke one way, some the other. Um, I think it's quite clear that Locke does think that secondary qualities are in objects. But secondary qualities in objects are powers. Now, Barclay read Locke as denying that secondary qualities are in objects. He thought Locke was saying that secondary qualities are just in the mind, not in objects. But Locke is actually pretty clear on the matter if you look at his chapter on the adequacy of ideas. So I've quoted a little passage there. Now, an adequate idea is one which faithfully represents what it is the idea of. So whether an idea is adequate or not depends on the faithfulness of the representation. And Locke, being a, an empiricist, is trying to find a suitable foundation for our knowledge. How can we know that any of our perceptions of the world are securely anchored in the way things are? And Locke comes up with a very ingenious solution to this. It's really quite clever. Take the simple idea of yellow that I get from looking at something yellow. Just that particular colour, not the shape, just the yellowness. And I ask myself, is that thing really yellow? Is my idea of yellow a faithful representation of what is there? And Locke says, yes it is, definitely. Simple ideas are certainly adequate, because being intent to express nothing but the power in things to produce in the mind such a sensation, it follows, since I see the yellow, the thing itself must have the power to produce that idea, and that's all I mean by calling it yellow, that it has that power. Therefore, my idea must be adequate. Very ingenious. If something causes the idea of yellow in me, then that is its being yellow. There's nothing more to being yellow than having the power to produce the idea in me. So at least we can tick off the simple ideas, like yellow, as corresponding to the way things are. Now that's quite important. It's an important epistemological point and a very subtle and clever one. Locke is saying that an object being yellow is not a matter of there being anything in the object that resembles my idea of yellow. It's simply a matter of the object having whatever qualities it is that normally and naturally produce the idea of yellow. So that gives us something solid epistemologically to build on. And this is just one example of a quite fundamental shift between Descartes and Locke. Descartes looks at a piece of wax in Meditation 2 and finds that his sensory perceptions are leading him radically astray and reckons that the only way that he can get a proper adequate idea of what's there is to use his intellect to penetrate into the nature of matter and see that its essence is extension. So Descartes wants to found everything on intellectual perception. But here is Locke founding everything on sensory perception and saying, here we have a solid anchor. So it's quite a deep move. Uh, but he, at this point, I'm just mainly using it to, to prove that Locke does think that secondary qualities are in object. So, when you read Locke and Barclay on these things, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that Barclay and indeed Hume get Locke wrong in this particular. So, what is the distinction between primary and secondary qualities? It is not, as Barclay and Hume thought, that primary qualities are in objects and secondary qualities aren't. That's not the distinction. It's rather that the ideas of primary qualities are resemblances of them. 
and their patterns do really exist in the bodies themselves. But the ideas produced in us by these secondary qualities have no resemblance of them at all. There is nothing like our ideas existing in the bodies themselves. So when I say that uh, something, a round yellow thing, is round, I'm attributing a property to it which resembles my idea. The roundness of the object and the roundness, as it were, uh, as perceived by me, are supposed to resemble. Whereas the yellowness of the object is not a resemblance of my idea at all. My idea of yellow, the phenomenal character of it, the yellowness that I see, is completely different from whatever it is in the object that causes that idea. Yellowness in the object is a matter, we speculate, of the microstructure, the surface texture, the corpuscles, the shape of the corpuscles, how they're arranged, the way that light reflects off them and so forth. And it's resemblance rather than presence in the object that distinguishes primary and secondary qualities. Okay, now Berkeley famously attacks Locke on this as on many other things. And Berkeley wants to say that an idea cannot resemble an object. An idea can be like nothing but an idea. A colour or figure can be like nothing but another colour or figure. So he attacks Locke's claim concerning resemblance. He wants to say that ideas are, as it were, intrinsically perceivable. There's something about them which just, in their very nature, has to be perceived. Now, I think this is very plausible with secondary qualities. Suppose, for example, you imagine the smell of lavender. Okay, imagine that I've got some lavender essence and I sprinkle it around the lecture theatre and, and you sniff it. You get that smell, that smell of lavender. Right. Could that smell exist outside a mind? I don't mean the substance that causes the smell, I mean the smell itself. That. Could that exist outside a mind? No, surely not. If nobody existed, if there were none of us, if there were no people to have that smell, or no animals to have that smell, then the smell would not exist even if the substance did. It is plausible to say that nothing physical can be like a smell. A smell is just intrinsically something which has to be in a mind, has to be perceived in order to exist. That's a very plausible claim. Okay, now think about a colour. Think about the yellowness of that light. And I don't mean whatever it is that causes the yellow now. I mean the perceived yellowness, the phenomenal idea that you get. Think of the difference between yellow and red or blue or whatever. It feels different to us. It looks different. Can that look exist outside a mind? Plausibly not. Plausibly, the look, the phenomenal look, what it is like to see it, can only exist by someone actually seeing it, just as the smell can only exist by someone actually smelling it. So, if you think of things in that way, Berkeley's principle that for ideas, their being is their being perceived, seems very plausible. But what about primary qualities? We think, well, the roundness of the light, what, that's not the same. Okay, I look at the light and I see it as round, and I don't feel anything like the same reluctance to say that a real object can be round. The roundness is not something that can only exist by being perceived. At least that's it's our natural inclination to say that. And Berkeley wants to argue against that. And in the case of primary qualities, you can see he's got much more of an uphill battle um, arguing the point. It doesn't seem that ideas of primary qualities have quite the same intimate connection with being perceived, with mentality. And part of the reason is that they're more abstract and structural. Um, we can use the abstract mathematical properties of shapes to think about them in a way that seems to correspond with the real world. I mean, give an, I'll give an example. Um, 
imagine that you have a rectangle. OK. Now imagine a diagonal line drawn from the bottom left corner of the rectangle to the top right corner of the rectangle. Now imagine a vertical line bisecting the, re the rectangle so it, so it goes from the middle of the top to the middle of the bottom. From the point where those two lines meet, imagine a horizontal line being drawn to the right. Where does it cross the boundary of the rectangle? And you will all say, well, halfway up the right-hand side. And you'd be right. At least I hope so. Now, we can do that sort of imagining. We can imagine an idea and we think actually correctly that if we were to do that with physical objects and so on, everything would work out. We would find that the kind of thinking we're doing, the structural thinking we're doing, does seem to match up with physical objects in the world. And that goes together with the fact that attributing to objects properties that are structurally similar to our mental picture of them does actually work which makes it quite plausible that the objects in themselves, though perhaps you know, in many ways very, very different from our conception of them, nevertheless have a sort of structural isomorphism, a, a similar structure to the way we conceive of them, at least in respect of their shape, size and so forth. If you want to read more on this, uh, Jonathan Lowe's book on Locke, the Routledge book, uh, discusses these sorts of issues um, at the pages I've referred to there. OK, so we can make some sense of primary qualities in general, like shape and size and motion, resembling somehow our ideas of them. It seems at any rate to make a lot more sense than the thought of uh, primary qualities resembling a smell or a colour. But solidity seems to be a bit of an odd man out here. OK, so we've got our nice divide between primary qualities and secondary qualities. We've got secondary qualities that seem to be intimately connected with perception. We've got primary qualities which seem to be more abstract and structural and we seem to be able to make some sense at least of our ideas of primary qualities resembling primary qualities in the objects themselves. But solidity? Does my idea of solidity resemble solidity in the object itself? Can I make any sense of that? That's not so clear. How do I get my idea of solidity? Well, I get it by kind of pushing against things or seeing one thing bash into another and knock it out of the way. It looks like my only idea of solidity comes from seeing things behave in a particular way. I don't seem to have any intrinsic idea of solidity in the way that I might do of a shape or a size or a movement. So when we say that objects are solid, it's not clear that we really understand in any intimate way, what we're saying. I mean, solidity seems to be a power, a disposition, a way of behaving. It's the power to exclude other bodies. So what's a body then? Well, a body is something solid. But if we can't understand solidity except as a power to exclude other solid bodies, it looks like we're just going in a circle. So here is David Hume uh, attacking on precisely this line. Two non-entities cannot exclude each other from their places. Now I ask, what idea do we form of these bodies or objects to which we suppose solidity to belong? To say that we conceive them merely as solid is to run on in infinitum. Extension must necessarily be considered either as coloured, which is a false idea, because it's a secondary quality which we're supposing not to be an object, or as solid, which brings us back to the first question. Hence, after the exclusion of colours and so forth from the rank of external existences, there remains nothing which can afford us a just and consistent idea of body. So what Hume is saying here is the particular idea of solidity is highly problematic. It doesn't seem to fit in to the category of ideas which we can coherently form as somehow an idea of object as resembling the way we conceive of them. 
And if you try to get an adequate conception of solidity, you fail. You have to think of a body as excluding other bodies, but the only sense you can form of that is either to think of a body as a coloured expanse or to think of it as a solid expanse. The latter just gives you circularity, the former brings you back to secondary qualities. So, the attack on resemblance, on the resemblance thesis, naturally leads us to an attack based on our lack of understanding of the qualities concerned. So here you can see empiricism playing a big role. Remember, Locke is very notable for his empiricism, for insisting that all our ideas must derive from experience. All our ideas are copied, as it were, from experience. Berkeley and Hume both follow him in this. But if our ideas are copied from experience, then it seems that our ideas of primary qualities must be infused with the experiential qualities through which we experience them. When I see a shape, a circular shape, I see it as coloured. It's only because it's coloured that I can see it at all. Well, if that's so, what doesn't it follow that my idea of a shape must intrinsically be coloured? And if secondary qualities like colour cannot exist except in a mind, then the same is going to go for the primary qualities isn't it? Well, maybe not. Why can't I see a yellow circle, a blue circle, a red circle, and so forth, and then form the abstract idea of a circle? Just a circle, not with any particular colour. Why can't I do that? In which case, that idea of circularity is not going to be, as it were, contaminated with subjective secondary qualities. Maybe I can form the idea of something which is circular but not coloured. Well, Berkeley and Hume both attack Locke, saying that we cannot do this. And they attack Locke on the doctrine of abstraction. Now, you may remember, Locke's doctrine of abstraction is that we form general ideas by leaving out detail. So, for example, uh, a child, the first man that a child gets to know is probably uh, his father. So the child forms the idea of his father. Then he begins to meet other men and notices their similarity and notices their difference, no doubt, from the women that he meets. And then he forms the abstract idea of a man by leaving out details. So some men he meets are tall, some are short, some are fat, some are thin, some are dark, some are fair, some have beards, some don't. The child forms the abstract idea of a man by leaving out all the distinctive features and just retaining the general features of manness. So that's Locke's doctrine of abstraction. Berkeley very strongly attacks it. He says you can't do that. There's no way you can form the idea of a man who is neither tall nor short, nor fat nor thin, nor with a beard nor without one. That's inconsistent. You cannot imagine such a thing because such a thing cannot exist in reality. Any more than you can form the idea of a triangle which is neither equilateral nor isosceles nor scalene. It's impossible to do these things. And when you read Berkeley, you might wonder, why is, why is he making such a big thing about abstraction? Why is it so important to him? Well, the reason that it's important to him comes back to this business of primary and secondary qualities. Berkeley wants to say that I cannot form the idea of a circle which has no colour. And if I can't form the idea of a primary quality circle without the secondary quality colour, and if all my ideas of secondary qualities are intrinsically mental, they cannot exist outside a mind, then it follows that I cannot even conceive of a primary quality which can exist independently of a mind. I cannot form that conception. And that's why he put such a lot of emphasis on it. If you read Berkeley's Principles, uh, most of the introduction is devoted to an attack on abstraction. That's why. So Berkeley concludes from this argument that bodies independent of mind are literally inconceivable. You cannot even conceive of an object existing outside a mind. Now, if that's right, then it follows that the world has to consist ultimately of mental entities, spirits and ideas. So you get to Berkeley's famous idealism. <clears throat> 
Now, most of us probably are not going to be very attracted by idealism. It seems the kind of extravagant metaphysical nonsense that philosophers love spouting, uh, but no commonsensical person could possibly believe. Uh, Samuel Johnson is uh, famously said to have uh, uh, discussed Berkeley in these terms, uh, kicking a stone, he said, I refute him thus. And the idea was that the solidity of the stone clearly shows that uh, real physical objects exist outside minds. Well, suppose we want to have a rather more uh, considered reaction to Berkeley. The right thing to do seems to be just to concede that our notion of body is not likely to be ultimately composed of elements that we can fully understand in the kinds of terms that Locke thought we could. If we try to form an idea of body as consisting entirely of properties that resemble our ideas, then we have this problem of understanding what it is that fills the space. And maybe we just have to concede that in the case of a property like solidity, we just can't do that. We have to attribute body as having a something I know not what that fills the space. Is that a problem? Well, Barclay and co wanted to say that was a problem. Uh, that a theory that attributes a something I know not what is no theory at all. But actually we can see with the uh, progress of modern science that this has become a much more familiar idea. Okay, at the time, the best physical theory, the corpuscularian theory, had this interesting coincidence that the properties attributed to matter were at the same time properties that seemed intrinsically intelligible, that made sense. Again, Locke wanted to say, that in, in praising the corpuscularian hypothesis, he praises the fact that it is so intelligible. Shape, size, motion, these are things that we can understand readily enough. And it seems to make sense when one thing bashes into another and makes it move. It's got that kind of intrinsic intelligibility. So we naturally get the idea that the fundamental problem, properties of matter, the properties in terms of which we're explaining everything, including matter's appearance, those properties are ones which are intelligible to us. Then we look critically at solidity and we find actually maybe it's not so simple. Maybe we, in order to draw a distinction between matter and empty space, we have to attribute this crucial property, solidity, or something like that, which is a property that we can only understand indirectly, in dispositional terms, in terms of what it does. We have to say there's this something we know not what that keeps other something we know not what's out. And that looks at first to be undesirable. But then you look at modern theories and you see things like mass, charge, spin, strangeness, all these funny properties that we start attributing to fundamental particles. We come up with things like quantum mechanics where we more or less have to give up any attempt to understand the fundamental properties of things in terms that we find naturally intelligible. And we have to face up to the fact that it, as evolved creatures, our senses are naturally fitted to understand the world at one level, but that doesn't mean by any means that our intuitive understanding is going to work all the way down. So maybe we just have to accept that our best theories are quite likely to attribute fundamental properties to objects which are radically different from anything that we are intuitively aware of. So we do have to say, well, there's this something I know not what which has this, these properties. I call it charge. It can be either positive or negative. It has the property that a positive attracts a negative and a positive repels a positive and so forth. All I can do is give you equations at best which describe how these things behave. But if you say, what is it? All I can say is, well, it's a something I know not what that has these properties. So at the time, that looked unacceptable. I think the reason it looked unacceptable because the scientists of the time had this illusion, a very attractive illusion, that the world was going to be comprehensible, 
and the illusion was fostered by having a physical theory which seemed to be so intuitively neat and nice. The crack there comes with solidity. If you really push at that, uh, you come to a quite different conclusion about the way in which an ideal, what an ideal science can be. It cannot attribute uh, ultimate properties that we will necessarily find intelligible. Okay, let's move on to consider the issue of perception in, in a little more detail. I've suggested that realism can be defended. It can be defended as long as we're prepared to relax the requirement of intelligibility. But that's not the only way in which realism can be attacked. So Locke uh, famously is an indirect realist. Uh, when I perceive a tree, there's an idea in my mind, that's what's directly, I directly perceive in the sense that I'm directly aware of the idea of the tree in my mind. And I assume that there is a material object which is the cause of this idea. This naturally brings the so-called veil of perception problem. How do we know that there really is a material object, as it were, beyond the veil of my ideas? Does this trap me within my ideas? Well, it can seem to do so, particularly if you're tempted by what I shall call the unacceptable interpretation. Now, it, it is possible to parody indirect realism like this. Okay, there's a tree out there, I'm looking at the tree. How do we explain it? Well, we explain it by postulating an idea in my mind, an idea of a tree which is in my mind. Okay, so I see the tree by seeing the idea in my mind. Now, what does seeing the idea in my mind amount to? Well, maybe there's a little homunculus, a little me, in there, looking at a screen. And on the screen is an image of a tree. And that's the idea of the tree. So I see the tree by the homunculus in here seeing the image of the tree. Now, that clearly is not explanatory. Okay. Because it's explaining perception of the tree in terms of perception of the idea of a tree. And that's not got us anywhere. It's replaced one mystery by another mystery. So that interpretation, I take it, is clearly wrong. And certainly that can, that can naturally lead to the following sort of puzzle. You know. uh, if you think about it, what happens when, when you see a tree, the image on your retina is upside down, right? Because of the way that the eye works as a camera. And it can seem really puzzling that we don't see the tree as upside down. Why? If you think about it, it shouldn't be so puzzling at all. Why should you expect it to appear upside down unless you are trapped by the unacceptable interpretation? Unless you're thinking that somehow that image has to be seen. And the projection of that image onto the retina just is part of the process of seeing. And by some intricate mechanism that we vaguely understand, but not very well, uh, hopefully in the next 50, 100 years we'll get to understand it a lot better, we are aware of the tree through by means of this physical process. But it is not because there is some little man in there looking at a screen. Now, 20th century philosophers have tended to prefer to talk about sense data rather than ideas. But beware when you read stuff about sense data, there's always this temptation to think of it in terms of the unacceptable interpretation. It's much better to say that awareness of a sense datum counts as perception of an external object. So it's not that you perceive a sense datum and thus perceive an external object. Rather, you are aware of the sense datum. Think of the sense datum as simply the way in which the object appears to you. But how can we know that there really is an object out there, as it were, beyond what we are immediately aware of? How can we prove that causal link? Well, here is David Hume presenting the problem in a, his uh, characteristically pithy way. It is a question of fact whether the perceptions of the senses be produced by external objects resembling them. How shall this question be determined? By experience, surely. Hume says experience is the only way by which we can establish any causal connection. But here experience is and must be entirely silent. 
The mind has never anything present to it but the perceptions, and cannot possibly reach any experience of their connection with objects. The supposition of such a connection is, therefore, without any foundation in reasoning. So here's the challenge. Once you accept that there is a difference between the object out there and your perception of the object, however you interpret that, a sceptical question can be raised, how do we know that there are any objects there? And what Hume is saying is, we only directly um, perceive or we're only directly aware of those perceptions, of things as they appear. How can we ever establish a reliable causal connection between the supposed objects out there and our perceptions if we're only ever acquainted with our own perceptions? We never get the God's eye view to see this correlation between objects and perceptions. So how can we know that there are any objects? Well, one attempt uh, that was made particularly in the 20th century, to get round this, though it, uh, you can see very much um, themes of this in Berkeley's work, is so-called phenomenalism. Phenomenalism is the view that physical objects are logical constructions out of sense data. So statements about physical objects are to be interpreted in terms of statements about sense data. So saying that an object is in a particular place is like making a statement about what you would perceive in certain circumstances. So saying that there is a lectern here is making a statement about the perceptions that I or you would have if we made certain movements. Those perceptions would correspond with the apparent experience of a lectern. And maybe the physical existence of the lectern just is to be analysed in terms of those perceptions. Well, that's trying to get round the sort of Berkeleyan argument. Uh, Berkeley wants to say that you can't make sense of physical objects in abstraction from perceptions. Here is an account that actually aims to analyse physical objects as perceptions. It also is trying to get round the veil of perception problem. If, if I am acquainted with my own perceptions, and if physical objects just are to be analysed in terms of my perceptions, then it looks as though we can get round that sceptical worry. Or at least it might look like that. Here again, um, just as we saw, we've seen before, uh, the problem of horizontal scepticism can be raised just as effectively. Uh, phenomenalism is trying to get round a kind of vertical scepticism by saying, well, if we can't prove this exi the existence of this different kind of thing, the physical objects, let's just analyse those in terms of what we do know about, namely our own perceptions. But again, we can raise the problem of induction. Uh, suppose you do analyse the existence of a physical object in terms of perceptions that you would perceive in certain circumstances, you've still got the problem of justifying the claim that those predictions are actually true. Well, phenomenalism was uh, very popular in the, uh, the mid-20th century. It hasn't been so popular since. Much more popular uh, since J.L. Austin and P.F. Strawson has been uh, to insist that we perceive objects directly. So the claim is that instead of being indirect realists in the way of Locke, instead of saying that we perceive objects, as it were, by having ideas of them, it, we should say instead that we perceive them directly. What does that mean? What does it mean to say that we perceive objects directly? Well, in one sense, it seems definitely right, insofar as it counters the unacceptable interpretation. Okay, if somebody thinks that we see objects by means of a little man in the head seeing a screen, that's dead wrong. We do not perceive our ideas. We perceive objects. So when I look at a tree, it's the tree that I see. It's not an image of a tree. However, and this is the problem with it, there is no question that my seeing the tree is mediated by a physical process which involves things like light rays and so on, uh, impacting on my retina, involves signals going up the optic nerve, 
involves the brain doing all sorts of clever jiggery pokery, which somehow makes me aware of the tree. Simply insisting that the only thing I see is the tree, while in a sense that's true, I do see the tree, I don't see an idea of the tree in anything like the same sense, that doesn't actually, unfortunately, help the sceptical problem. Because the sceptic can still perfectly well say, look, the experience that you're having, I grant you, if it is caused by the existence of a tree in the appropriate way, then I grant that you're seeing the tree. I'll even grant that you're seeing it directly, if that's the language you want to use, fine. But how do you know that it is, in fact, caused by the existence of a tree? How do you know you're not a brain in a vat, etc.? So, the insistence on direct perception, though it does have some point, I think, particularly encountering the unacceptable interpretation, doesn't really help against the sceptic. Uh, it merely gives a, a, a verbal solution, as it were, rather than a, a genuine one. Well, can we move back to a sort of Lockean position? A Lockean position which accepts that there is a difference between the object itself and how the object appears to us. We have to draw that distinction. We have to be aware that there are potential sceptical worries here, that it is possible logically to distinguish the one from the other, and therefore that it's not a logical impossibility for me to be in the situation as of seeing a tree without there actually being a tree there. I could be hallucinating, I could be a brain in a vat, and so on. Well, to get rid of the unacceptable interpretation, instead of thinking of an idea as a little image of a tree, instead think of the idea as what we might call an intentional object. So it's not like a little tree in the mind, it's rather how a tree appears to me. Well, that's a bit difficult to pin down. It's not exactly an image, it's not really an object at all, nor is it really an explanatory thing within the, 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 the causal story of how my perception comes around. Rather, what we're saying is this, when I perceive a tree, there is a characteristic experience of what it is like to perceive a tree. And since we can distinguish that experience from the actual being of a tree, let us talk about the idea of a tree as capturing just that. It's not an object, but it's what it's like to see a tree. Okay, is that still a representative theory of perception? Well, who cares what we call it? Uh, a lot of Locke's language can plausibly be understood in that way, not in terms of ideas as little things projected on mental screens, but rather in terms of the way in which we encounter objects. Uh, to read more on this, again, so we're getting here into some quite deep issues where trying to cover them within the compass of a lecture is quite tricky. Um, I think John Mackey's book, Problems from Locke, uh, gives a pretty good discussion of this sort of approach. Uh, pages 40, 47 to 51, as I've uh, indicated there. Well, in that case, what we end up doing is going back to a Lockean indirect realism. In a sense, it's indirect, in a sense, not, all right? We're, we're not saying that there, there are these little ideas that are somehow intermediaries. We're rather reflecting the fact that when we perceive objects, there is an experience that it is like perceiving those objects, and one can draw this conceptual distinction between our awareness of them and the existence of them. So how do we justify the existence of those objects? How do we get round Hume's problem, where he says, you never experience the link between the objects and the perceptions, so how can you justify the claim that there are any objects there? Well, we justify the existence of the external objects in terms of their scientific explanatoriness. How things appear to us is explicable in terms of mechanisms that attribute causal powers to these objects, uh, that explain them in terms of physical intermediaries like light rays, like sound waves, and so on. And these explanations do actually enable us to predict the, things, the way that things behave. 
So, as I mentioned earlier, we can think of physical properties, things like size and shape and so on, as corresponding structurally to our ideas of them. And we do find, in fact, that if we make predictions based on that, the predictions tend to be reliable. Uh, by attributing a ball or a block or whatever with a particular size and shape and physical properties corresponding broadly to our conception of them, we can end up with predictions about what we will perceive that end up broadly right. So, isn't the simplest explanation there, rather than going to Barclay's God, which is supposedly orchestrating the whole show, to suppose that there really are things out there, something like, at least structurally something like, our conceptions of them. Now these explanations, the causal explanations of how things behave, of how things bring about our perceptions, those explanations are going to be, have to be in terms of the object's real qualities. But we can drop the requirement, as we've said, that those real qualities that we attribute must resemble our ideas. We are free to give explanations in terms of things like charge and spin and strangeness and whatever. Uh, we should not feel trapped by the paradigm of the 17th and 18th centuries when so many people were looking for a scientific explanation that would inevitably appeal to real qualities that had ultimately to resemble our ideas. We have to be prepared to accept that the world as it is out there is actually more radically different from our ideas than even the scientists of that time thought it to be. Thank you. Thank you.